what is DevSecOps and why is it important, right? You know, uh, the why is really simple. Uh, they're gunning for you. And that's not a, a small thing. I believe that if we do not master DevSecOps and security in general, uh, the risk to our companies and to ourselves, our lifestyle, everything is so extreme, it's an existential risk. So to give you some idea, you know, you see it says $3 trillion. That, that's not a wrong number. I think that actually is low. Value estimated market value destroyed by cybercrime. That's theft. That is company A getting a head up over company B because they stole their, their IP. Uh, it is direct losses to companies, $15 million a year on average. Think about one million new pieces of malware created every single day. It's, it's bizarre. You can go to markets and like, you know, you go to Amazon and buy a book. Well, you go to uh, Thievazon, whatever, and you buy a virus or, or something like that. What's incredibly, incredibly uh, notable is that companies take forever to find out about these things. Uh, I personally know of companies that have had uh, attacks, exploits that have been stealing their IP and money for more than a year. But 140 days is is the average. And uh, so 82% of all companies expect to face a cyber attack. That's, that's wrong. 100% of, of companies should expect it. And actually, it should be like 500% of companies because there's no such thing as a cyber attack. There is a collection of them. Right? So the most important thing to understand is this is a rubber hammer, right? It, it, is, it doesn't matter how hard you bash the thing to get it back in its box. It's coming at you constantly. And so that means we have to address uh, security constantly. How do you do that? How do you uh, get good at that? Well, uh, you have to design app problems before they occur. And uh, that means you have to make it really, really hard for things that have not been invented yet to make exploits against your software. You have to make it really hard for uh, social uh, attacks to work so they won't occur. You have to make Everyone in your organization understand it, understand how important security is. Uh, so, you know, uh, Ryan talked really qu quickly about DevOps is the union of people, process, and products to enable continuous delivery of value to your, your end users. Well, uh, you know, what I would say is that's entirely right, but the people are the most important part of the question. So there's all sorts of technical things we can do to you know, secure our world, whether putting up pipes, you know, firewalls and letting, you know, traffic only go from certain places as a metaphor or virus scanning. But the most important thing we can do, uh, the thing I believe you have to do is ultimately work on your culture. So culture trumps pe uh, people. Culture is the thing that informs the people what they're to do. People certainly trump process and process certainly uh, trumps the products you do. They're all important, but if you don't start with a security-focused mindset where, where everyone in your organization is thinking uh, about how to make your entire estate more secure, you're going to run into lots of problems. So the first thing to take away from that is silos are bad, right? Uh, very often, and Ryan mentioned this, that you, know, you have a dev team in some cases, and then you have a security team, and then you have a deployment team, and you have an operations team. Those days are over already, and companies that are not going to understand and internalize the fact that they have to basically bring responsibility for pieces of their world to every one of their employees, as opposed to handing things over the wall to some small cabal of people who might or might not do uh, security measures. Well, if, if you have silos, it's very, very bad, right? So... With that said, I'm going to talk about DevSecOps, and, and there are going to be some prescriptive things here. Uh, I have very little time, so I won't get into any demos, but I want to show you a, certainly a screen or two in at the Azure portal if we have enough time. Uh, but DevSecOps is a really good start. And, and I always like to quote a, a, a quote from Margaret Mead, the famed anthropologist, uh, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. In a security context, never doubt 
that your own personal work and the work of the people who are working directly with you can affect the security in your organization and secure, indeed, you know, uh, everything about your company from, from attack. To protect your company from existential risk that may literally put you on the street may literally affect, uh, adversely affect the lives of thousands of millions in many cases, depending on the size of your company. So it's important. That's the big important thing to do. So DevSecOps puts security at the heart of all the stuff that, that Ryan was talking about. It is not the sort of thing that you sprinkle a little security on at the, the end of the process. It is the central topic that you should be thinking about all the time. And indeed, if you don't get to the point where it is central to what you're, you're thinking about and uh, working on all the time, you're never going to achieve security. Security, again, is not achieved by some policies and some firewall rules by some people on high. It needs the participation of everyone throughout the entire organization. So, how do we do that? For starters, uh, you create the culture, right? But we're going to talk about automation. Automation is the end result of this. It is like the thing you build to, which ultimately exact exerts the security. But people buying into changing the way they do their world, that is the thing that allows you to create tooling that, that helps your security really be more effective and more powerful. So, uh, you know, you can automate security to some extent, but, you know, there are so many exploits that you're always going to have to have people that are committed to improving your security stance. So we look for all sorts of patterns, bad things that are happening. Uh, we think for, uh, you know, whether it be people in your organization writing down passwords somewhere, it's a horrendous Horrendous thing. I would suggest if I own the company and people are writing down passwords, they should be fired. I realize that is really draconian, uh, but it turns out that there are modern practices and patterns that we can now do that greatly enhance our security in this never-ending war. And we have to adopt good patterns, right? So, so firstly, we're going to talk about Azure sort of stuff. So you should have infrastructure per environment, so I, subscription per environment for starting, right? So you should never, ever, ever mingle development software with production software or even QA or stage software. Every subscription, every environment should have a subscription. And I'll make the contention you should have many successive environments. At Microsoft, uh, we very typically have five or six rings where we roll out software progressively over time. And they're all separated. You know, you have a dev ring where you do some loosey-goosey sort of stuff and you tighten it up through ring one and ring two and ring three. And maybe you're deploying in the first uh, instance in ring zero to only people in the building, then people in your state, then people maybe in your country, then the, you know, worldwide and so forth. So by progressively limiting the surface area, where bad things can happen. That's one of the first infrastructure -y sort of things that you can do that's good. Then there are policies to control security that can be transparent and proactive. And we'll talk, talk about that, that also. Policies are both human policies and technical policies. In Azure, we have a, a technology called Azure Policy, which allows you to do things like say, Anytime you have a VM, you have to have a virus checker installed, thing, things like that. And that will be automatically monitored and, in some cases, if you choose to, inserted. There are tooling that we have. We have Security Center and Sentinel. Basically, things that we have in uh, Azure to help you deal with the first line of security breaches. Be aware of things, be able to monitor things, be able to introspect on things, you know? Uh, and so the tooling to support you should be on from day one. Uh, infrastructure as code, Ryan talked a lot about that. Uh, and there's no other way. There should not only not be uh, non-infrastructure as code, I tend to take it to the point that you should literally not even have dev research environments as infrastructure and code, you should start with your ARM template and your desired state 
configuration from, from that very first point. And there's a good reason why it's cultural again. Uh, if you think that, you know, defining the infrastructure as code, which is ultimately a definitional uh, spec to say, hey, this is what I want. And you say, I'll, I'll add that later sort of stuff. That's already a bad culture. That's already a bad code smell. You're not doing the things that you should be very versed at doing from day one. One of the big differences between DevOps and prior to DevOps is that it's normal and regular and usual. And so people are used to it, people who are comfortable with it. Classically, you know, I like for instance, I, I did consulting for a large employment board and they had 500 people working on software and every four or five months they did a release. And I swear it was hard attack time. It was like so, so scary to press the button. Every time they press the button to do a release, they risk the company uh, going out of business because they'd screw everything over. If your deployments, if your builds, if your monitoring, if your uh, security uh, principles and policies and everything are just normal and the things you do today to day, you have a higher chance that, that you will succeed in having a secure environment. So production only for CI CD pipelines. Everything that goes out there uh, should be ready to be in production. And then you're testing as a theory at each level is indeed, does it match my thesis, was, which was, hey, I've created some software and I've deployed it to some environment. Now I'm going to see if my thoughts that it was secure, is it actually secure? So, uh, and CI CD is the heart of uh, security, mostly because it allows you to lock all sorts of things down and automate things away. So you still have to have people figuring out how to create and do the right things step by step. But CICD sort of like takes a snapshot of people's thinking, right? Mm -hmm. So we solve one security problem by, you know, maybe adding monitoring or by adding a security control or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then that is people deciding to do things. But then the CICD pipeline, you can think of it as rendering it in a... Uh, repeatable stone. <laughs> That's a bad, bad metaphor, but I hope it, you understand what I mean. So, uh, so one of the ways that we enforce security is we have this whole notion of management groups and subscriptions. So management groups, think of them are a collection of applications living in, uh, in, well, firstly, they live in Applications live in resource groups, which live in subscriptions, which are managed by a management group, which is a set of policies and, and role-based access control. Uh, and uh, the idea about these is you can control a lot of things. I'm going to bring up a, a window here. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I know I have. Uh, there it is. <laughs> sorry. Too many win windows up. And uh, so I just wanted to go and show you what policies are. So we're going to look at policies, and I'm just going to look at some definitions. And to give you some sense of the scale of this thing, let's say I wanted to go look at, I, I, I don't know, uh, Australian government ISM protection, right? It, whatever. That turns out to be a collection of hundreds of policies, things that you have keep, need to keep track of. Well, that turns out that it's, it's too much for any person to even get in their head all at once. There are hundreds and hundreds of policies, you know, whether an Azure Active Directory administrator should be provisioned for SQL servers, as an example, or vulnerability assessment should be enabled in SQL managed instance. It doesn't matter what the things are. Policies are things that you or other smart people have figured out that need to be exerted, and then they encapsulate either uh, exerting those policies or as in making changes directly or notifying when things are out of policy and everything in between. So, um, so we start by planning your infrastructure wisely. So you have to govern Azure platform securely using best practices and very proactively. 
you know? So uh, one of the things that I really like about our tools like Azure Security Center is that Security Center, which is based upon machine learning and using a very large data set, turns out the world uh, and, uh, com you know, compute resources and activities across them, across the entire world. Instead of just setting up static security, like I set up a password and, uh, you know, you can't get in because you don't know my password into something. Security Center looks at activity <laughs> to see if people who shouldn't normally be touching something. So someone in the HR department should never be touching the deployment of some software, as an example. It notices things like that. So that's the proactive side of, of this. So, um, you know, you want to make sure that uh, by effectively using automation and effectively using policy and other design things, you're going to have less effort to get more results. We are all hassled in our jobs. We are all trying to do other stuff than do security. But until you make that point where everyone is involved in security and everyone is putting in a reasonable amount of effort that they do not think of it as exceptionally onerous, until you're at that point, you're not going to have great security. So management groups are in a place, they're really, really, really great for setting the baseline, right? So they don't take care of everything, right? You know, they, they range from saying that we're going to name things consistently. It turns out naming is really, really important because you want to be able to look at logs and other signals and say, oh, something happened over here and that feels wrong. Right. Uh, and of course, we're going to have separate prod and non prod resources. It's proactive approach. Again, policies can uh, be used to just say, hey, something is out of policy. Policy could literally make changes. And this can be across your entire organization, across your, your business unit, across your feature team. Uh, and so uh, compliance, security, business requirements are all good input into the stuff. Then the governance gets applied by utilizing CICD pipeline. Since you're not having people put things in by hand, you can use your policies automatically and make sure everything conforms. Uh, also, um, one of the really, really nice things that ha has come out lately, and I don't remember if uh, Ryan talked about this, is with ARM templates, Sometimes ARM templates can be, take a long time to deploy, right? If you're deploying thousands of machines that have, uh, you know, hierarchies, you have to install uh, server A before you install server B in something, which can take, take a fair amount of time. And very often those fail. Uh, they can fail because uh, you're trying to do something that policy has been set up to not allow. Well, uh, Azure... Uh, Resource management, what if, allows you to see if things are going to succeed or not without having you go to the bother of actually doing deployments. So, uh, again, Azure Security Center and Sentinel are a single pane of glass. The less places you have to look, the less human interaction you have to have with things except in judgment. Hey, that doesn't look right. And that's based upon... Uh, information being raised through our automation uh, and machine learning to tell you that, the more likely you're gonna have a better experience, right? So uh, unfortunately, I have so little time, I am literally at time. So, so Ryan, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Ron, could you tell me how much time I, I have? Oh, I go another like five, six minutes, I'm still- uh, Cool, cool, thank you so much. That's fine. So, you know, the solution, for security goes across many magisteria, right? So firstly, before you do anything, you know, uh, you should be doing threat modeling. Is, is my stuff uh, vulnerable? Is my ID, the tools that I'm using, uh, such as Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code helping me do security? There are secure coding standards. Are your people adhering to them? And, you know, tooling allows that to happen. And you should, of course, be set up to do pull requests and peer review to look at your code to say, hey, this doesn't feel right. So when you commit code, we can do static uh, code analysis, which basically looks at your existing code and just says, uh, 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 you're like keeping uh, variables out in the open. 
you know, uh, maybe literally you, you've committed, uh, you know, credentials to your source code, which is a big no-no. There are security uh, unit tests and dependency management also to make sure all the pieces that you're going to work with work with the, the right way. Very often, uh, you know, you can capture a lot of things before you get to the pre-commit by good reviews and good policy in uh, security code and then the static code analysis. And then, um, you know, it's really important to do security scanning. And, you know, we acquired GitHub about a year and a half, two year, years ago. And one of the very, very pleasing things about GitHub is I've been getting reports on rather old, thankfully not new, uh, repositories uh, that have vulnerabilities. They were vulnerabilities, maybe they were vulnerabilities originally and I didn't capture them, or uh, maybe they are vulnerabilities that are, have just cropped up. But the point is, we can find more and more about security uh, stance of our entire state uh, through uh, security scanning. There is acceptance testing also, you don't, you know, one of the things, and I, I don't remember if Ryan showed this, is, you know, between successive stages of deployment, you can have authorization, pre-deployment or post-deployment, by one or more people, and, that, and, and quite frankly, one or more processes, too. So, for instance, you could have a Twitter analysis to see if, if people talking about their, their passwords being hacked, literally. It's all part of the pro uh you know, you know proactive side of things not just uh creating static resources but uh setting th things up uh directly that you can uh look at what is happening so uh anyway in production you should do security smoke tests uh penetration tests quite frankly hire companies uh white hat white hat hackers to try to break in and look at your code and see if it's working or not and is secure. I can tell you, uh, having gone through several pen testing uh, evolutions, it never feels right and you, almost always you're penetrated, right? And then you work on it and then you're penetrated less and then you're penetrated less and no one likes doing it. 100% of the time, it, it, people at management say, you guys suck, why did, that, why did that work? But the point is, by having active testing you have a higher likelihood of, um, you know, improving your world and having your team understand what didn't work and improving on that. So, uh, you know, then you go into monitoring, which is continuous monitoring, right? And whether it be uh, logging things in, looking at audit logs, looking at things through Security Center or Sentinel, whether it be your SIM tool, you know, Splunk Oxite, which are uh, all uh, connectable to our state. Uh, and then really important is you have to have postmortems on what's working and what's not. This is why the agile methodologies, particularly like we do at Microsoft, where we have feature teams that own cradle to grave their feature. They start from you know planning to do the work and doing the work and deploying and monitoring and handling with live incident site incidents, including security problems, all small groups of, of, of people uh, who have deep responsibility and knowledge of their own area, their, their world. And it turns out it's incredibly important to be able to talk about what worked and didn't work and not have blame. You should assume breach. Every company should assume breach. You should assume that your security firewall, your security barrier, your whatever uh, is... Uh, you know, the best that it possibly can, but it's probably breached. And so you should have, uh, you know, procedures for dealing with, with uh, breaches as you learn about them, uh, uh, procedures for mitigating the possibility of problems. So I'm almost out of time. So I, I want to actually just, you know, I have a full deck around here, but the thing I want to leave you with is, uh, you know, that ultimately... DevSecOps is about you and your team and fostering a security culture at your organization. And if you do that, if you entitle uh, and empower your people to be responsible for security, to be aware of security, to improve security, and if you help them understand 
the deep existential risk they have to their livelihoods, their communities, their countries, whatever, if this doesn't get secured, that's all to the well and good. So this deck, I imagine Ron will, will make, uh, will make uh, work. And please, please, uh, let me see if I can get that going because it's a funny sort of thing. Here you have an example of security theater. Do not do security theater. Do not pretend that it's something that you can just pretend to touch someone and there's, there's no problem. It's serious. You should be taking care of it. So this deck will be available, I, I assume. There's a whole bunch of resources about it. And thank you very much.